Okay. Okay. So here we are. And um, I guess we could call this our wood season kickoff gathering. And um, Lonnie's going to speak in a minute about how we're going to be working our way into the wood element this evening. But before we do that, I want to do what we often do, which is to give the meta context for these conversations. So it's not just that we're, we love getting together, we love being able to share with listeners some of these ideas, but it's also a very uh, conscious practice that we're engaging in that we call an intersubjective dialogue. There's lots of names for what we're doing here. Um, but it is a new or emergent form of conversation, we could say, that is inviting each of us to not only speak from our own perspective, but to be in awareness of the multiplicity of perspectives that are simultaneously present here and how those perspectives mingle and mix and actually constellate in a kind of field of presence that is greater than any of us alone. And we've been engaging in this process for, I guess, almost two years now, uh, which is amazing. And over this time, I myself have been increasingly aware of other groups and gatherings that are engaging similarly in a process of what's being called dialogue, but specifically intersubjective dialogue where the listening to the group field is as important as um, speaking our own ideas or perspectives. And it is in itself a kind of emergent new possibility that seems to be kind of blossoming all over the planet. I mean, it's happening in lots of places. And the reason I think that it is emergent in this way is that it is in a sense, the leading edge of where human consciousness is moving now, it moving beyond the imprisonment of an isolation of the ego into a way of being present in our own unique identities within a field, within a collective. So it's an exciting, almost as if we're opening a conduit right here, right now to a different way of being together. And we're always surprised by what emerges. But the thing that I've been very aware of and wanted to speak to specifically tonight is that what I'm watching, what I'm aware of as we're doing this and we're doing it together is that the practice requires a kind of bivalent attention. That's a different kind of attention than we're used to, not just focusing on what I have to say or what the other person has to say, but a kind of oscillating between what's happening out there in our field and then what's happening internally on a sort of somatic internal response level. And through that oscillation between intersubjectivity, how we are together, and intrasubjectivity, how am I inside in my response, something new begins to emerge. And that newness is almost like a third, a third awareness or a third that's not, that doesn't belong to any of us alone and yet couldn't be here without each of us being here. So this oscillating between the internal responses of the somatic kind of knowing and the outer build of the field is kind of what we see as the conversation grows. And I would say for those of you who've been listening or tune in to also be in awareness yourself of how the conversation lands in you 
the feelings, the somatic responses, and notice the energetics of the conversation as it kind of blossoms through the time we're together. So that's why I wanted, those have been on my mind very much, this bivalent, the necessity to learn to listen in and listen out that we're all practicing together in order for this third kind of magical movement to happen. So I'm gonna turn this over, Lonnie, to you with this idea of emergence, like that we are emerging something uh, here. And- <laughs> Great, thank you, Laurie, that's beautiful. So we had the idea that over the course of the, the seasons that we would do one for each element, beginning now with wood. And wood is about emergence and it's about radical perspective and all embracing perspective. And I always consider that the liver channel in a sense begins with kidney one on the bottom of the foot, the eye on the bottom of the foot staring into the abyss, channeling from kidney one to liver one and up through GV20, the eye on the top of the head, looking up toward heaven. So there's this radical perspective and absolute embrace of the, the striving toward intuiting the deepest root all the way to the striving of the outermost branch. And spring is about new beginnings, liver, gallbladder, about decision-making, planning, ultimately about choice and i'm reminded of gallbladder 24 the the characters for it being the sun and the moon and when we put those together we get the image of clarity and also the character for enlightenment for enlightened consciousness ming for illumination and there is something about new beginnings there's a perspective that we can awaken to a sort of shocking perspective, which is the ultimacy of freedom of choice. We can awaken in one moment, it just takes a shift of awareness. Most of us are conditioned for genetic basis and cultural reasons reinforced to a relative reality, a relative perspective, a biographical self born in time, with so many years of life experience that will end and die in time. And that biographical self becomes our reality. And we're entrained by genetics and entrained by culture to constrain our awareness to it. But there can be a momentary shift of attention, even if it's a trillionth of a trillionth of a second off of that, where there becomes a time freedom where all of history the all the present and all of the future are here right now in the moment. And this one moment is the only moment that is. And in that moment of, we can say, an appearance of an absolute awareness of the freedom to choose, we can see that we actually have the potential to make a different choice, unconstrained by history to do something radically different. Anyone who ever gave up an addiction at one moment had to make a choice, I'm not doing this. And they, they might've had to make that choice 100,000 times a day for years and years and years. But there was one moment where, the, where we decided, I'm done, the karmic line ends here. And we make that choice. And it just, this has been a truth in my life. Now, you know, we, see, we have that choice. We see this in a moment of clarity. And when we commit to it, then we tend to meet every force in heaven and earth that supports us in continuing with that choice. And every force on heaven and earth outside of us and within us that opposes us being able to stick to that conviction. And then we have to confront the history and, and clear the shadow and confront all the structures in culture, both within our own minds 
and culture outside of us that resists this commitment we've made to doing something deeper, higher, wider, better, taking things further, starting things anew, beginning things fresh. And it's it's in gaining some degree of um, some degree of success, some degree of victory in that path that I've experienced gaining soul depth. Soul depth coming from what it's actually taken to 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 live up to the commitment that I made in that moment of radical clarity, and a kind of spiritual self confidence that all of the storms that might be generated, the, all that wind and confusion that in the spring that might be generated as forces of resistance to consolidating that new self, um, as, as some measure of victory is gained in the face of that, there's a confidence that on the other side of every dark night, there's a new light, there's a new beginning, there's hope that liver 14 to lung one, kind of where aspiration meets inspiration. And um, so, so it, it's just, it may, I think I said this in the last talk. I can't remember if it was our last talk or another one I did recently, but as I look around the world today, you know, we look at this conflict in the Middle East. And I think we can say it's among if it's not the most, it's one of the most historied, complex social dynamics on the face of the earth. And um, the conflict's been going on for a long time, and there's a lot of history, and yet it's apparent to me that there is the imminent possibility that it could just stop. That a choice could be made that when the heart breaks, if enough heart breaks on each side, the choice can be made, we can't go on doing this. We have to stop. We don't have to stop in the future. There's no future we can stop in. The only time we can ever stop is now. And it may be naive of me, but my life experience leads me to believe that if this is true for me as an individual and other people I've seen make such choices, that it can be true for culture. And um, that we're at a time of um, environmental peril and things are heating up all over the world, both figured, both actually and figuratively. And wood gives us the ability to awaken and make a choice for a new beginning. And I, I have, as a wood constitutional type, at least, I have com complete supreme um, faith and not just faith, but actual experience that this can be done. And so I thought we could all look through the eyes of the wood element in the context I've created and, and just talk about the possibility of radical new beginnings in a way in a way where the vision of them is inspired by the momentary recognition of at least the appearance that I'm on, that anything is possible. There's no inherent limitation. And for this moment, we're unconstrained by history. And then of course, in time, we're gonna find history that needs to be dealt with will show up, but it can be approached rather than from being entangled in it, from a few steps back from it, a few breaths back from it with a bit more objectivity. Well, that was a nice shot of espresso. Thank you, Lonnie. Fantastic. <laughs> my, my my experience, my experience is this this sense of a, an unrelenting, an unrelenting fire that at its at its at its uh, edge is nothing but possibility. There's nothing but possibility. There's nothing but this quality of the soaring, the release, the, the being released from that bow and just fly, flying 
head head first, heart first into um, anything, anything with this uh, unrelenting dynamism and interest in what's here, what's next. There's an there's a sense of this sort of I want to say fierce directionality, but at, at the edge, it feels in a way not fierce at all, but like a like a newborn sprout. But yet it has this momentum, this unrelenting momentum, and yet it's as gentle and as fluid as a a, a new a newborn a newborn burst. With all of this, the fierceness and the power of this wood dynamic, it, it's easy to take that so into, this is what I want to happen. This, I want the no war. I want world peace. I want, and that's already truncating all possibilities. And unless I've surrendered it, unless I've gone to that, you know, met it at water, where where I've completely let go. I'm not imposing any outcome. There's no effort at all in trusting and allowing this new possibility to emerge through the power of surrender that allows that wood to come up of its own accord. And while I have the ability to direct it because of what's in my heart, because of what's in my kidneys, because of the impulse that comes through the wood in me, I'm still not imposing. That there's, it's the surrender I feel that has the power. And I go back when, when Lonnie, you talked about that, that choice, when that choice is made that has all of that power. When I've experienced that choice, it doesn't feel like my choice until I claim it. It feels like a possibility is received. And then I claim it and it becomes mine. But until that time, it's not mine. It comes through that field of surrender that allows a new possibility, a third possibility that I can't see till it's there. I have to uh, agree with Randy. And for me, um, that experience of that impulse moving forward often comes with uh, letting go. And I, when I've let go of my agenda, an unfolding occurs, a stirring. Uh, this, the intent moves ahead with its own momentum in the in the direction of my heart's desire um mysteriously unfolds as if as if my soul can orchestrate the heart's desire without the constraint of the ego's intent if that that's sort of how I feel it um is an aspect of what Randine was just verbalizing um uh, the seed that is, has been planted, the desires of the heart somehow have a certain impetus and I have to let go of something in order for that action. It's almost, it's almost as if inaction is often the action for me. Inaction meaning the, the holding back of too detailed a planning or a, a, a constraint through just uh, through um, 
um, over planning maybe or um, that letting go has has the letting go is almost like the opposite mechanism for moving forward and, and somehow it plays a, a role in shooting that arrow out. Somehow there's a, an opening, an opening between the objective and subjective, um, which is that third point of awareness that Lori was uh, uh, addressing that what I call transdisciplinary, what people call transdisciplinary state of awareness sustains both the intention and the sacrifice to to the moment and for for us as human beings uh, we we must have movement that movement comes of course through the sinews and and, and we at this time, of course, you gaze upon the eastern horizon, recognizing that the sun's rising in, in uh, a cardinal space of motion and evolution. And we are part of that. That temporality is the emergence it's the emergence in the first quarter of the moon. It's the emergence within the, the first portion of spring. And, and our frustrations arise when somehow that emergence is obstructed by our own thoughts and feelings, thoughts and feelings of others. And as Lonnie was discussing the notion of deeper, wider, and further, that very resonance of wood with the planet Jupiter and its whole concept of expansion and beneficence and all the virtues that go with this positive state of wood really ultimately would be just thrown into the fire and burned as a sacrifice to an awakening. And that awakening is the emergence from the liminal zone that the wood brings. It's, it's nascent and emergent. It's liminal, it's not fully awakened. We come into that place of full awakening through that sacred flame of sacrifice. And there's like a there's like a, a singeing of of uh, um, an incinerating of in that flame of our perspectives that um, are gripping around their own certainty, and it reminds me of um, like Gebser's a perspectivity, and he uses the word a meaning free from not the absence of so it's not the absence of perspective and it's free from perspective not meaning we don't have a perspective it's just that we're free to live into all perspective including the ones that have yet to be born and so i get this this sense as you're speaking of this this you know these these incinerating fires that sort of burn to a crisp these places that are um, rigidified that become the constraint to move beyond the the to move beyond the known which is like a big deal 
you know, it's great to, to be interested in emergence, but then to face what it would mean to let everything go enough to arrive at something that has never been conceived of. That's an immediate co-dying and blooming, you know, all at the same moment. Yeah, and at the, um, both Vasanti and Randine mentioned surrender. And I think surrender is one face of it, but the question is, what are we surrendering? Because the other, the other half of it, I, the other face of it is a kind of radical engagement with. It's not just a sort of Taoist merging with, aligning our heads with the river and being taken willy-nilly wherever it happens to go. There is actually a direction and an intention. There's a surrendering of the ego and its fears and desires and maybe its hopes and dreams and its attachments in the world, but there's a radical engagement with, with this fire, which is Eros, which is the creative impulse, the life force. Um, that arrow being shot out of the abyss, just in a straight line toward heaven, you know, um, that, so, so the wood, it's like liver three is Chang, and that character Chang is both a whirlpool returning to an abyss, but it also means a geyser exploding up toward heaven. So there's this, there's a return to roots, a return to an embrace of the unconscious depth and a surrender to that, but at the same time, an explosion coming, a radical creative explosion coming out that demands my absolute part creative participation as a as a willing partner, as in this discussion, to go somewhere new to, and then I can start to feel the tendrils of consciousness reaching out into the unknown, and start to start to intuit the call of something, an imminence, an imminence to intuit and start to viscerally feel, and learn to feel imminent potential on the verge of being manifest toward the true, toward the good, toward the beautiful, toward something new, and, and learn to follow that and engage with that and pursue that and, and feel that as a deep passion um, in the heart and a deep value in, in um, communication with others. And I've always felt that that capacity was absolutely vital in my clinical practice and had quite a few patients even 20 years later write me and tell me it was just your un unrelenting belief and vision of who I could be that that helped me, that that was the most pervasive force in healing. Behind all the treatments and everything else, it was that vision that of 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 my potential beyond what I could see and feared to embrace. And, and it's not that I ever knew exactly what they should be doing, but it's just doing the points, doing the herbs and in relationship, catalyzing the release of an imminent potential that they became too oriented toward that in their life in a way that that mystery, you know, revealed itself and birthed itself in front of us. Or, and sometimes many, many years after we had stopped working together. Um, Lonnie, I, I think you, that's very well put. Uh, when, I, when I said surrender, I think it was the surrender of my ego that may be rooted in fear and clinging to a certain kind of plan to soothe itself. When I release, when I when one when I when I release that that desire to plan and constrain, as I said, this is basically illusion and fear. That's when the seeds of my desire flourish, like you said. It, it's an unfolding, and I'm committed to that unfolding, and I go with it. And I allow it. It's leading me, but I am I am participating in the journey into the unknown and how wondrous it can be wherever it's taking me. 
Yes. If that clarifies that use of the word surrender earlier on. I, I thought that's what you meant. I was just elaborating. Yeah. Yes, I, I think you elaborated well. <laughs> do indeed thanks for setting us up at the beginning and there are lots of sensations in the field there as i was listening to all of you um the i think the, the what's emerging for me here as i'm listening to the conversation is this tension between that element of wood that is moving forward that is momentum that is explosive power that instinctually wants to pop forward just like a sprout is is all instinct when it's like here in Oregon we had cold winter and then all of a sudden it was 70 degrees and immediately you can see the magnolia flowers and the plum flowers burst forth just following without thinking this this imp impulse of nature so it's uh <laughs> this momentum and on one side and uh, on the other hand, there is wood is being generated by water, which is w the annihilation of winter on one side and the softness and flexibility that the bamboo has in a tree as it sways in the wind without the water, it gets brittle. And that is indeed the, in my own life, the sort of the, the uh, one thing where you always have to examine this drive, this tendency to want to move forward. Where is that coming from? Is that the structure of your ego and the desires of some kind of miasmic thing? It's like, you got to be a doctor, you got to be a lawyer, you got to be a good son, you got to be a good husband. And a good person and and this is what this defines and now you are following that construct and put all of your energy into it or is it actually the opposite uh, of what Olani was referring to at the beginning is this exploding uh, because in a certain way spring is explosion right if you put the word explosion anywhere it would be there it's this sudden change right yin yang spring and fall the, you've got the the bianghua, the change something out of nothing is spring and uh something going back into nothingness is fall and winter and so the emergence is very often explosive and explosion uh deconstructs it's uh it's it's annihilating everything and so the 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 sensations I had in my own life where I felt like exactly what Lonnie was describing, some kind of brilliance of the heart, not the mind, but some certainty, some inner certainty where you know, regardless of what other people think, regardless what uh, you thought before, this is being exploded in a moment very often, in my case, very often through life-threatening disease or so, where all of a sudden everything, the safety mechanisms go out of the window and you just feel like, okay, this is all the stuff you thought before was important, not that important anymore. And I'm going to um, build something completely or follow a completely different voice here. And without that, I wouldn't be in the field of medicine. I would, would have been doing something completely different. But that's exactly, I felt like that was an impetus that was not only did feel right and didn't come from the brain, but from here or from a intracellular space where you just felt like you were acting for once in unison with some kind of universal momentum. It wasn't just you against the universe or in the universe in some kind of separated shell, but um, moving forward in a place of true integrity and um, where all of a sudden all the concerns about uh, societal constructs were not there. And I often think like Lonnie, myself, if, if you can do that, and I see that in my patients where there is a certain conditioning and people seeing 
perhaps through their disease that this is not working for them. And then all of a sudden they embark on something completely new uh, that works not just for them, but their environment. There is a, you go like, why not? Why not a whole culture? Why not a nation? Why not the world? Uh, it's 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 right. We are in a medicine that talks about resonating layers. So we have different entities that are technically, theoretically, all the same. So it's I always hope for that that something is instead of doing always the same things. Right. This is the painful thing. If we study history. It's this rise and fall of empires and crazy people who have this huge ego, whether that's the money or politics or so, that they are using the momentum inside of themselves to overpower, sometimes with military force or some kind of explosiveness, uh, rather than something where something completely new emerges that is not repeating the old egoic kind of construct and pattern. And so that's the dualism and in, in right that the hexagram that the Chinese used to describe the energy of the winter solstice is Fu, which means do it again. But in that doing again, we want to, so there is a pattern, it's always spring and then comes summer and that's fall and comes winter. It's in that sense, always the same, but it's never just a closed loop, it's a spiral. And as it goes around every year, every moment, there is a potential to, to be on a different plane and make a different choice and achieve that level of illumination and freedom that uh, Lonnie was speaking about. But um, I concur with all the other voices I've heard with the surrender, the water, annihilation and surrender needs to come first because if there is any speck of ego left then there is an agenda and there is a construct and then that movement on this higher level is hard to accomplish but not impossible not impossible no and there's always going to be more than a speck of ego left so yeah. i i think that's the thing is there's there's this moment of realization where consciousness recognizes I'm free. I've always been free. I could never be anything but free. And that's inspirational because we can see a brand new possibility in that moment. But then, of course, ego's just fallen into the background. It hasn't gone anywhere. And then when we then when we give ourselves to that new inspiration, all the forces of resistance within and all our history and all our unresolved shadow will be there. But now we can look at it from the perspective of a, a possibility. You know, so for instance, Martin Luther King in the mountaintop speech stood there and said, I have been, you know, I have seen, I have a dream and I have seen what's possible. And I might not get there with you, but in the speaking of it, he brings it all into the moment. So everyone who hears that speech knows that that choice is possible, that it can be made. And then here we are, what is it, 50 years later? And we've had a black president. We have a black female vice president. There have been a a lot of changes. We have black arch conservatives on the Supreme Court. <laughs> and um, there have been a lot of changes and there's a lot of work to do and there's still a lot of cultural ego but, but in that moment of realization there's this vision of a future possibility that we don't have to wait for the future to manifest we're going to live it right now and, and, and that's kind of a, for me that's the inspiration of wood that moksha that instantaneous enlightenment and then, of course, you know, wood wants a sandwich, but Earth has to get the seeds, plant the seeds, grow the seeds, harvest the seeds, separate the wheat from the chaff, chew the bread, digest the bread, assimilate it into the bloodstream, and 
so that there's energy to do it all over. So there's instantaneous awareness and then there's all the process. But I'm talking to, you know, what I'm trying to create is that perspective and wood of, of just that instantaneous sudden burst of, of realization of being unconstrained and anything's possible in, in that moment, the inspiration of that, the vision of that. The eros of it. No, we're talking about eros here. Nobody ever said to their partner, you look really good. Do you think we can get together maybe in seven or eight days, maybe 7.15 next Wednesday? And uh, that's not what eros wants. Eros is like right here, right now. You know, I'm really grateful, actually, that we're having this conversation about wood. I'm really glad we decided <clears throat> to honor the elements in some way here. But I think I'm also still really stuck on <clears throat> this other piece that's been very present for me about, you know, when we talk about um, evolution or the evolutionary leap, I'm actually feeling present in this very moment to an evolutionary leap of my own understanding of wood. You know, it's almost like for 40 years, I've been living into the wood the, as, you know, the wood as what we're talking about, like I become that emergence, that daring, you know, risk taking of the gallbladder to in the moment of the huntun, in the moment of chaos, you know, through that winter, taking the risk to sprout in 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 the character itself, you know, that the in in the character for chaos, the the seed sprouts into the wave crashing over it and is and it doesn't care. It's going to do that sprouting of the self, taking risking everything. And I love that energy of wood and it's been the energetic of wood that I've you know kind of held and supported and cultivated but as we're speaking about this evolutionary impulse and listening and being in this sort of cubistic conversation what's coming to me very clearly is this other aspect of wood which is its virtue you know, because you say, oh, well, how could the virtue be if, if I'm all in this emergence of self, also the virtue of benevolence? You know, and what's coming to me as I'm listening is that the emergence, the new beginning here that we're actually talking about is, is having at the same time that tension between the I become. I insist, I commit, I commit without hesitation to the becoming of myself, while at the very same time, I'm holding the benevolence of all beings that through my becoming, all beings can become, you know, that, and thinking in terms of right outside the the way that the tree becomes itself within, within a community. And that that is actually what we're, that is the evolutionary in this very moment, what we're talking about, the new possibility or the new beginning is to live into both of those at the same time. The I-ness as well as the we-ness of the forest. Um, and even in the character um, Weiji for the crisis point that we're at, that part of that character is speaking about many trees, you know, that it's not just one, that we are, that somehow the choice has to do with the multi, the manyness of us, as well as the singleness of my emergence. So that's what's been circulating as I'm listening, like, how do we how do we live into that as an emergent evolutionary impulse in this very moment? 
as we enter this spring. Well, what, com what comes up for me as you're speaking is, is the, the sense of when the individual is able to allow themselves to be taken by this impulse whose frothing edge is unrelenting hope, it, it's then immediately, um, that vision is immediately cast upon the hearts of everyone we encounter. And it comes back to something I think Lonnie was saying that like that unrelenting hope in another person doesn't come from a thought of like, I feel hopeful because of some reason that I have. It's just this recognition, experiential recognition that you are a hundred percent possible right now with no doubt. I have no doubt that you are a hundred percent possible because that, that, Un unrelenting arrow is is moving through my own heart and so i can't help but see it everywhere it's that vision that's occurring in the individual becomes the vision that sees through the layers of the world into this whatever layer of depth i can access in me i immediately see it everywhere and and then it becomes this this leaning in because again it's like that fierceness that's gentle yeah but it's also like a like a lion or a tiger and saying yeah i believe in you how could i not you are the you are the the cosmic impulse yeah. right here right now weeping your your tears that are you know breaking breaking us through these barriers and 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 these these things that are hanging on us those trembling tears are are you know allowing those things to unshackle and so that that's what comes up it's like the i and the we become one and it's one cosmos discovering itself and anything's possible and and this is this is liver blood this deep compassion and softness that that nourishes the tendons and and so that everything can move and bend as Hannah was saying so the bamboo can be supple so so there's this relentless positive growth this buddha nature that we're talking about that we awaken to in ourselves and then as alexandra says we see this in everything but there's also a deep compassionate embrace it's not it, it's not a question of okay, change now, change now, change now. It's just it's just holding the heart and the patient and ourselves and the planet, yeah, in without any inherent sense of limitation. Not indulging an inherent sense of limitation, and then being open and interested, but also passionately engaged and committed too. It's amazing because as you both are speaking now, I'm <clears throat> realizing that I'm actually sitting here drinking um, maple sap. I didn't even, uh, as you, when you spoke of that and, and tapping this maple tree right now and the absolute, um, that that givingness of the wood, it is a different, it, it came to me in that moment, right? Like, when we think of the that fierce sort of eruptive quality, there's also like, it's just this tree is out there giving me this water every day now. And it's a very old tree. It's a tree that actually is dying and it's still offering me this elixir. It's, it's, it's blood, it's blood that it's just giving, you know, I just tapped a little, little bit of invitation into the tree and she's just like, here I am. This is your clearing drink for the spring. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lori, for bringing up the virtues. That's, that's indeed, uh, sums it up 
Well, because the, the wood virtue, as you were saying, is uh, benevolence or another translation is compassion, or we could simply say love, which is love for others, love for the world, love for the cosmos. In a nutshell, the Confucians who where the virtues come from, they that entire philosophy you could capture as love others and save the fall and autumn coolness and restraint for yourself and don't do the opposite. Don't just narcissistically go like it's all about me and then give the criticism to others and blame everybody else. And so that is indeed the 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 the, the, the impetus of spring is not like I'm here, it has that too, but it's what my purpose is like a tree in the forest where I'm there to contain and create together with others the 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 the, the forest as a whole. And that's that's what it's all about. You know, it's so funny because as you speak, Heiner, I'm I reminded of Leon saying it's it's good to have someone to blame, but um, <laughs> you know, and uh, and the care and nurturing that 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 requires the forgiveness of self, the forgiveness of other that that allows that to be so is is something. But and and Laurie, as you're speaking of the tree, I, I live in a forest here. I look out over a lake and over a mountain. So even in winter, every day. I go for a walk. I'm in the floor. I'm still with the wood. The wood stays with me. Right. There's this. There are these moments where the snow is so heavy, though. There's no visible wood at all. And and those those quiet. It's so quiet. The silence is deafening. And. Uh, so, so here we are in the great awakening. I'm very grateful that the tree, this particular tree, came <laughs> present. It was just like all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm drinking this water right here. And and as we're sitting, and I'm, this tree is probably going to come down soon. Um, it actually sacrificed the top of itself a couple of weeks ago. And what I'm really aware of as we're talking is that even as it's this tree is dying, it's still offering, it's still giving of its own water, of its own blood. It's just to the to me, but also to its branching into all these creatures that live in it. And um, so really it's kind of a revisioning of, you know, how we're we often hold that moment in the Shen cycle as, you know, this emergence of of the self but it's also this entanglement in the great in the wholeness i love taking it out of the idea of time and emergence into the future which is so wood, of course, and what's next, what's next, what's next. And this idea of expectation and creating a better world and, and all of that impulse, but going back into that sense of, you know, that the, the Shing cycle and the reverse Shing cycle are simultaneously going on, that the death and the birth are simultaneously going on, that the tree is dying as it gives itself to the new possibility. That, and that emergence that comes out of now, which I believe is, is true hope, like hope without a future is the most potent force there is. 
And I remember this patient who I was working with that so needed some hope because all of her physicians had taken it away. And she looked at me and she said, just open-ended, is there hope? And I said, of course there's hope. And she drank it in, in that moment. And I could feel the change in her. She knew it wasn't the hope for what she thought it would be, but there was something more real that she drank in hope. It wasn't something where, what's next? Am I gonna get this? this, this. And something radical shifted in her and something that was beyond any medical possibility happened. <laughs> and against all hope, she conceived. There was no medical possibility that it could have happened, and it did, because something, it, it was that emergence, that hope that had nothing to do with what comes next, shifted something. And I think that's the real, it, it's almost a, um, uh, like a fourth dimension that enters where because of heaven, earth, and I, there's a, there's a fourth possibility now that, that even the laws of possibility were changed. Well, the wood isn't just this exploding forward. It's got the deepest roots. And, and, and of course, Jung said that the tree that would grow to heaven has to send its roots to hell. So it's really this all-embracing perspective, this willingness to hold all of it. On the right-hand side of the Sheng cycle, we have the earth, spleen 21, the agape, the great motherly embrace, the love of the higher for the lower. But the wood is the love of the lower for the higher, the striving, but that striving is always two directions. It's not just up, it's, it's, it's an opening up and unrepressing of the diaphragm, allowing consciousness to look deeper, 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 and be deeply in love with the unconscious. So we're not, those tendrils aren't just going up into in quotes, a future, because the only moment is now there's this bilateral movement, you know, of this bi-directional movement of greater depth, greater height, and that depth is a soul depth, an increased relationship with the unconsciousness, not just this intellectual bursting into the consciousness. And this is a 360 degree perspective embrace with no inherent sense of limitation. So of course, liver 14, gate of hope, is this is goes to lung one, and liver 14 is this aspiration, and lung one is inspiration. And these two join, and then there, there's no one to practice medicine with the sense of no inherent limitation. Just no inherent limitation. There's always hope. When a doctor says it's impossible, they always mean if you listen to me. <laughs> well, I, I think this is this is so this is so potent because you know, Lonnie, you brought up in the beginning some some of the world events that are that are occurring. And of course, you know, there's so many things happening in this moment that humanity perceives as terrible, horrible impossible and hopeless and what i love i love this notion of hope without a future because what i what often seems to happen is that the hopelessness comes from looking at the current conditions and then trying to look into the future and not seeing a way out yes and yeah. and this this turns it upside this completely turns it inside out and upside down and say well yeah but what we're exploring here is a hope that doesn't require a future. It's an unrelenting positivity that doesn't know yet where it will arrive. In fact, it can't exist with a known future. Otherwise, it immediately isn't what it is that we're leaning into. And so it feels like this, this invitation 
for all of our all, all of us who come to moments where our hearts feel so heavy you talked about the spleen 21 where this enveloping can get filled with the weight and burden of humanity's pain one of its symptoms is pain all over the body it, it weighs down the heart to a point that we can no longer see what's possible and it feels like this is a, a really necessary tincture to drop into that well that that allows us to revision what hope means mm -hmm. and that it has nothing to do with seeing our way out of where we currently are it has to do with dropping into reaching down deeply enough to allow that soul depth depth to give birth to this cosmic fire that says i have no idea what we are going to do from here and let's lean into it together and 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 find out what's beyond what needs to die for us to discover the next possibility that hope without a future that is tom freedom and a perspectivity that's a beautiful i hope without a future that's beautiful we need t-shirts that say <laughs> we should start a hope, hope without a future foundation <laughs> <laughs> I loved how you put that, Alexander. The the it's uh, th that situation is like a like the the wood phase, right? The my, one of my teachers always said the uh, wood, earth, those things they're really different phases of movement. And so, of course, wood is starting and winter is ending, and then the other ones are in between stages. So, in terms of a human lifespan, then wood is of course a birth and infancy and so <clears throat> seeing the hope without a future would be looking at the world like a child does where there is no intellectual concept how to solve problems and get out of the war i remember my father growing up in this horrible scenario of the second world war waging in europe with all these atrocities going on and he when we asked him, that was, of course, probably not true if you ask uh, older people who were actually at the front lines and uh, et cetera. But uh, he just thought it was like watching fireworks. It was exciting to see the American bomber planes fly over Frankfurt or so. It was uh, like like an adventure kind mm -hmm. of a thing because it, it wasn't this kind of fearful and how are we going to solve this problem? It's this, this, this yeah hope without a future it's you living completely in the here and now and we have um uh lonnie mentioned at the very beginning and laurie did also the the word evolution this this kind of as we trying to to grow this use this impetus of the new beginning and of wood and as we trying to develop ourselves and evolve in this lifetime and become wiser and and enlightened really in the end it's like the the doubted gene says we can only really become fully enlightened if we return to come back to this child consciousness and and let go of all of these constructs that really if you could make them visible these intellectual constructs they would be like heavy baggages attached around our neck or so and uh just make us depressed and everybody around us as well so i was just struck just overall when heiner was talking about you know the return to this childlike state of course we're not talking about just a pre-personal simplicity but the evolution to a post-personal simplicity. And also to say what I'm, but I think what's the same with the child and the sage, the post-personal sage is this lack of cynicism. Mm. Mm. And I've, I just understand that cynicism, this inherent conditioning of the mind, of the heart by the mind to just limit our perspective to what's already known and to only be interested in what we already know and to just that that kind of cynicism is a poison to the heart 
and just the likeness of this unconstrained perspective and this limitless potential and a complete lack of cynicism. Like, I mean, Randine, when you told your patient, you know, there, there's an element because I've done this with people too. Of, well, of course there's hope, of course there's hope, but I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if it will happen, but there's always hope because we just don't know. And I can't be cynical about the possibility. So we'll give it everything and we'll find out together. And I, to me, that's just, it's just the optimism and the evolution of wood, but there's something very deeply compassionate because it's actually the context in which the heart can thrive because it's unconstrained and limitless. It's, I don't know, I don't know what the outcome will be, but let's give it everything and we'll find out. And if it doesn't happen, then we know that we did everything we could do. Mm -hmm. And there's something liber liberating in that. And that's all, all you can do is everything you can do. <laughs> you can't do more than that. Yeah, again, it's taking that hope and putting it in the right context because it had nothing to do. She was not saying, is there hope that I will be able to conceive? And it, it was not that. It came from a different place. It was a, it was a deeper well that needed to be fed. It, it, it was something that needed filling that took her out of this future orientation. And... <laughs> R Rendine, you also brought an un unbounding re resolve to the notion of hope in that moment. And that, that awakened in her the affirmation. And it allowed a letting go that didn't happen before that. She could not let go when there was expectation. But in that unconditional hope without a future, she could surrender to that. Mm -hmm. I think this, this really, does, and, and you had said, Lonnie, this lands us in that dimension of time freedom. And as I'm listening, I'm aware of this incredible relief from having to be sort of adhered or attached to a future, you know, that I have some control over. And in letting go of that and, and allowing or opening to hope as a presence as opposed to a futurity something really different begins to happen in my body but i'm also aware a number of times when you said it lonnie we don't know we don't know but we'll find out together and someone else i think you alexander in speaking to this mystery it, you said something about opening to it together. And I think that that, I know I keep coming back to this theme, but it's very present for me tonight, that there's something about the evolutionary leap that we're talking about now in leaving behind the isolation of the ego that's been such a dominant kind of straitjacket for a very long time. And even in my thinking about the wood as I originally learned it, <clears throat> as this, you know, sort of um, momentous leap of the self in really looking at it differently now, just in this very conversation that, that we're looking at a, a, a kind of weaving of possibility that happens without a plan or without a, but yet because of the, the multiplicity of weaving or the togetherness, something different begins to emerge. 
and that that's also a, a kind of quality of the wood, which is which is different than how I've looked at it. You know, Laura, you bring up the, the notion of mystery. You brought it forward a, a couple of times, uh, the idea of mystery. The mis and that, that mystery is the pathway by which water nourishes wood, the pathway of the, of the mysterious feminine, and that, that, uh, that place in the depth of the cosmos from which an emergence rises in, into the full presence of being. Mm, beautiful, yeah. Grant, do you want to try once more? I just want to say, can you hear me? Can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah, yeah, but that 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 emergence is mycelium, mycelial, that rather than a lone line of emergence, it is an emergent network, meshwork. <laughs> mycelium coursing in all directions through all things the capacity to bring that perception to the whole the wearing of which is only available to whole and that's all i have to say <laughs> so glad you said it that was perfect yeah. It's funny because as soon as you start to speak, your video freezes, but all of that did come through. And clearly one eye like this and <laughs> one eye closed. Eye and eye. Well, at that mycelium, I understand his woods just 360 degree perspective. And and, you know, in these dialogues, of course, we begin where we look inside, as Laurie, we look inside and something comes and we speak and somebody else hears it and they're listening and they're feeling inside and they speak. But you can feel that mycelial connection between all of us. And, and I also think that, you know, for me, that perspective has always been in the treatment room that it's there that all of culture is laying on that treatment table and that in my own life my approach has been when i make a choice to do something new to respond to a trigger a challenge in a way i never have before and i may not know what to do but i know i don't want to do what i've always done before because i know what the results are going to be and I just want to do something new. And I know that what I've learned is when I do something new, it doesn't just change me, it changes culture. Culture changes. When I make a choice for something better, higher, deeper, it's not just about me evolving. It's consciousness itself is evolving. And through that choice, it, it's not just that you know, about me feeling better or getting some relief. But I noticed that my relationships change, my, my relationships to everything and everyone change and people start acting differently and perspectives begin to open. And, and I understand that, Grant, as in a way of the mycelial metaphor of just how we're all connected through this. Well, I think that brings up to something that Laurie was pointing to is that as I can see more deeply into the world, that 360 degree perspective may not be completely accessible through an individual Alexander or an individual Laurie or an individual someone, but it's that recognition that this one cosmos that is emerging has a 360 degree perspective. And I may have to lean into my neighbor 
to discover a part of the perspective of this whole. And so there's that way in which you have the the sort of the the driving upward of of the wood, but then you also have that root structure that is, you know, as as Lori would probably say, tenacular. There's a kind of a <laughs> There's a there's an interweaving of root structure that has its own communication because wood as being the intermediary, you know, it's the intermediary between heaven and earth, but it's also the, also the intermediary on the horizontal between my neighbor and myself and all of culture and all of the the beings and the non sentience in the cosmos, and so then there's like this tapping in through this deeper visioning. There's this tapping into the recognition that that all-pervading omnipresent awareness is just that, and it's it's experiencing itself through a multiplicity of forms that are completely interdependent. It always starts there and it always ends there. I remember that uh, when it came to five, there were certain five element meditations or so, and you start with wood and you go to fire and you go to earth, and then you go to, uh, you know, either they had chants or you have visualizations, um, but you don't stop with water. You always come back to the wood to show that it's always that circle is always moving. So we always starting with that interconnectedness and the awareness thereof and we ending with it. And we always starting with love and we end with the love. That sounds like a good place to end. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect, Tyner. You're hired. <laughs> Let's keep him. <laughs> We're renewing your contract for the next uh... <laughs> Glad to hear that. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, everybody. Lots of love. And uh, we'll see you next time. And maybe, Lori, you can stay on for one minute. Bye-bye, mm -hmm. <laughs> everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you.